Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna call this meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. Um, as many of you know, we have a new superintendent in the Neshoba Regional School District. So we're trying something a little new this year. Uh, tonight's meeting is a joint meeting of the finance committees from each of the three member towns in the district. So we've got Bolton, Lancaster, and Stowe. Um, just wanna say hello and thank you to the members of the finance committees from Lancaster and Stowe for attending tonight. This year, um, the first year, Bolton is you know, hosting via Zoom this joint meeting, but it will rotate among the member towns in future years. Um, so on behalf of the three finance committees, I did wanna thank our superintendent, Kirk Downing, and the director of finance and operations, Pat Maroney. Um, and I think I saw Joan Angelis here as well, a few members of the school committee. So thank you all for participating and attending. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first, I just wanted to reiterate that tonight's meeting is primarily meant to be an opportunity for the finance committees to, to hear the same information at the same time um, and have a chance to ask questions of the district. Um, we are not taking any votes during tonight's meeting. So I just, that should have been clear from our agenda item, but I wanted to say that as well. Tonight is not, we're not voting on anything. It's informational. Um, second, since Bolton is hosting the joint meeting this time, I'll be serving as chair for tonight. <clears throat> so if you have a question or a comment, please use the raise hand function within Zoom, and then I'll try to recognize you at an appropriate time. Um, if we have time for questions and comments from the public, I'll definitely moderate those. Um, but I also just wanted to note that the district is having uh, their legally required public budget hearing on Tuesday, March 1st at 6.30 p.m. And I'll put a link to that uh, meeting in the chat. Um, so interested members of the public should certainly attend that and uh, offer comments then as well. And then finally, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that it's helpful to keep yourself on mute unless you've been recognized because otherwise it gets tough to hear all the information that's being shared. Um, so with that, again, thank you all for coming and I will turn it over to Superintendent Downing. I think I got it there. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Boyle, for inviting me here today. And I want to thank uh, the FinCom's advisories for all three of our towns, Bolton, Lancaster, and Stowe, for joining us. As, as uh, Mr. Boyle explained, we're looking to start a, a, a new tradition of how we share the budget information to all three of our towns through their finance committees in a consistent way where everybody hears the same message. So uh, our intention is while Bolton, Bolton is hosting this year, we'll rotate to the next town next year and, and go on a three-year cycle visiting each town uh, as hosting of this meeting. Um, and as Mr. Boyle said, opportunity for the public to comment and ask questions on the budget will be on March 1st at the uh, budget hearing, uh, which will be posted. So with that being said, Mr. Mr. Boyle, I'm going to share uh, my screen and pull up this evening's presentation. And let me manage myself here for just a moment. So thank you for your patience. I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Okay. So thank you all for coming. This is a preliminary budget presentation to the joint FinCons. Uh, it's preliminary because two of our major drivers are still not finalized, and those will have an impact on ultimately the final assessment in the budget. And we will certainly get to that part when we get to the um, uh, last part of the presentation. Uh, but this presentation is broken down into three sections. The first section is explaining how the budget is crafted in total. The second section is an explanation of how the towns are assessed because I feel that a lot of questions around those town assessments and understanding those deeply. So I'm so happy that this meeting is being recorded tonight because we are gonna use this recording uh, and file it away as an opportunity to educate folks on how the budget is crafted in a regional school system uh, in, in year over year. So, and then finally, the third part of the presentation will be getting into the actual FY 
23 budget and where we stand today. So let's start by explaining the budget. In FY22, the school district budget was $59,222,941. This was the total amount needed to fund the school system, but it's not the net funding. The net funding would include uh, grant programming on top of this dollar amount that funds some of our programs. And we'll talk about those later on as well. But this is what we look for in the school system budget that is um, what's needed both in local contributions and in state and federal funding sources. So, the budget begins with what is called a foundation budget from the state. And the state determines what this foundation budget amount is based upon uh, really the wealth of our district uh, relative to the overall uh, state budget. And so in FY22, the foundation budget was $34,723, uh, $734 million and change, let's say. Well, the the foundation budget, oh, excuse me, I clicked too fast. The foundation budget is made up of two different um, funding buckets, if you will. One is the minimum local contribution. This contribution is, is based on state formulas and the wealth, the wealth index of the towns. And so you can see those amounts in FY22 for each of our towns combined for almost $27 million required for our towns to contribute towards the school budget. This is a fixed assessment and determined by the state. We do not have any impact on these numbers. Well, you can see that 26,000 doesn't quite reach uh, the 34, uh, 26 million doesn't reach the 34 million in the foundation budget. So the balance of that is made up in what is called our chapter 78. This is a funding formula to adjust state dollars based upon, again, wealth index uh, in your towns as well as enrollment. And it's 59% of the state's foundation budget, the other 41% being chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, the chapter 70 is what fills in behind the 59%. So that's statewide. It's adjusted town by town. So it's never going to a breakdown in those proportions, particularly for wealthier towns. So for wealthier towns, the uh, required local contribution is always capped at 82.5% of the foundation budget, ensuring that your towns will always receive a minimum of 17.5% of their foundation budget received in Chapter 70 funds. Both Bolton and Stowe are at the 82.5% wealth index limit. The town of Lancaster is not. It is near the 74% uh, mark. So all those together equal our chapter 70 funding. So when you combine the minimum local contribution and chapter 78, you come to the $34 million within the foundation budget. So both of these are determined by state government sources. So then the question is, if we had a voted budget of $59 million and change, how do we get from the foundation budget and what other revenue sources are used to get us to that $59 million price tag? First, let's start with Andy. This is the excess and deficiency budget offset. This is similar similar, not exactly like, but similar to what a town might think of as the free cash dollars that can be applied to the budget. And it can offset the total line of the budget. Um, amounts exceeding 5% of the district's prior year uh, for operating capital costs uh, must be used. And those funds are certified every year of which we are anticipating uh, certifying $1.2 million worth of END funds this year. And FY22, $1.2 million was used to offset the budget. 
So as you see here, this is the revenue by source spreadsheet that you'll see later. And I'm just pointing out where the e and appropriation is cited in the uh, revenue streams. So let's talk about other sources of state and local revenue on that same sheet. As we looked at chapter 70, educational aid and regional transportation, these are both come to us from the state of Massachusetts. Regional transportation is a reimbursement for the cost of transporting students in a regional school system. This is the funding source that essentially allows us to provide transportation to all edges of our towns without charging our residents a fee for transportation as they do in many districts. Next is the E&D appropriation, which I just spoke about. Then we have a federal, federal revenue stream, which is the Medicaid revenue. This is a reimbursement revenue for students who um, have intensive medical needs. And these are just reimbursement uh, funds for those that qualify. And then we have some local uh, revenue sources, the investment income, charter school um, uh, reimbursements, and then other revenue in terms of the other revenue would be things like if we did commission furniture and it was sold at auction, those types of revenue streams that come back into the district. So as we look at those funding sources, we also got to be thinking about our debt assessment. The debt assessment cited in the budget, but it's also paid for by the towns. And this is outlined in the regional agreement and it's the town shares for currently right now, the uh, building upgrade that was done 20 years ago, the turf field, the leach field, and currently the feasibility study for uh, the new Neshoba High School building project that is currently in feasibility phase. So each town, has a share that contributes towards the debt assessment each year. And the, that is outlined in the regional agreement based upon uh, students attending the Neshoba Regional High School. And then the last part is the variable assessment. And this is the part that uh, when we look at locally is a number that we bring to the budget to ultimately get us to the number. This element is determined in the regional agreement based on enrollment. So in FY22, all three towns contributed to what was over $20 million in the total variable assessment. So for a $59 million budget, we have our fixed assessment, we have our revenue streams, and then we have the total variable assessment along with the debt assessment that is funded by our towns and then paid out in the budget. So let me go on here to explain the assessment a little bit. There's questions, why do total assessments change year over year and how can we better understand that? Each town's share of minimum local contribution debt and variable assessment determines their individual total assessments. So in the budget, you can see those three buckets add up to what is the total amount of local assessments. So the first thing we look at is the minimum lo local contribution that I mentioned before, and this is what it's looked like in recent years. The minimum local contribution is also known as the wealth factor. They take property values as well as median household incomes to determine the wealth factors of each of our communities in the state of Massachusetts, and then apply that to the funding formulas to come to these fixed amounts. These are amounts are instructed to us by the state of Massachusetts. So when you look closely at these funding amounts, I want you to look closely at Lancaster, over the last five years has grown in their required minimum local contribution, whereas the town of Stowe has remained relatively flat during that same period of time. And what that means is based on this, the funding formula from the state of Massachusetts, this is a way of communicating and saying, over the last five years, 
the wealth of Lancaster has increased relative to its baseline in FY18 than Stowe or Bolton has increased in that same period of time. So when you look at that in terms of a line graph, you'll see Bolton and Lancaster in their minimum local contribution dollar amounts have been increasing over the last five years relative to the town of Stowe. Now let's talk about the variable assessments. So this is outlined in the regional agreement and an aggregate of enrollment over the last five years is gathered each year to determine the percentages each town is responsible for paying on the variable assessment. So if you look at this chart here, you will see the enrollment over time in our school systems. Bolton from FY18 to FY22 is actually declined uh, by what looks like to be 88 students. Lancaster has declined by approximately 71, by, by 71 students. But look at the town of Stowe. Their enrollment from FY18 to FY22 has declined by over 600 students. So they have declined at a much larger rate than the other two towns. And you can see that clearly outlined in this graph. And I don't, I don't see a decline of 600 students on that last slide. It was like two or 300. I'm sorry, maybe I was looking at something wrong. Yeah, hold on, let me get you there. You were at 630, 6386 to 6045. That's like. No, 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 to, 5, 000, to 5867. It, it, that's like a 300, 300 uh, decrease. You're saying 600. It went from six, uh, 6,386 yeah. to 5,000. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't see the last column. <laughs> my, uh, yeah. my little thing is in the way, my, my Zoom thing. Sorry, yeah, I was no. looking at FY21. I was like, yeah. all right, and my apologies. Michelle, no problem at all. And, and when you see the enrollment number uh, this year, uh, that's where you'll see the 600. I'll, I'll, I'll show that uh, when we get to the third part. But this is how those numbers are expressed in this graph. So you can see as in, this is the enrollment number that we are required to report on from the regional agreement. And you can see we've, we've had some declining enrollment. I gave a presentation to the regional uh, agreement committee on this to, to show how we have been declining enrollment in our school system. And uh, it's, it's not due to students are going somewhere else. It's just the census numbers in the towns have been going down over this period of time based on what is called the school attending report that we do every year with the state of Massachusetts. So the next piece we come to is when you look at that five-year aggregate, you can see this is how it's expressed in the percentages. So for me to read these, I have to shift something here, very good. Um, so you can see, that decrease in enrollment, the effect that it's had on percentages over time. Whereas Bolton in FY18 was 31.8. In FY22, their share over that five-year period had increased to 32.6. Lancaster had increased from 29.5 to 30.3. Stowe has decreased from 38.6 to 37.0. That is a direct relation. That is the direct relationship to this decline in enrollment that has happened over the five year period. And that is a requirement as outlined in the regional agreement. So if one town relative to the other two towns declines, the natural effect is that the others will increase when you have a fixed share of 100%. So when you express the variable assessment share in dollars for each town, 
this is what it looks like over time. Over time. Uh, you can see that the dollar amounts uh, increased because budgets grew, but the relative percentage of responsibility increased for Bolton and Lancaster while it decreased for Stealth. So here's that expressed in a graph. So coming back here, the variable assessment, the changes in variable assessment over time. So the last piece on the assessments is the debt assessment uh, that I explained earlier. And this is the portion, the shares each town has paid over the last five years and the debt assessment. So when you combine minimum local contribution, the variable assessment and the debt assessment, that's how you get to the total assessments for each town. So as we look at this graph, you can see that Stowe has remained relatively flat while Bolton and Lancaster have increased comparatively. Set in another way, this is the year over year percent increases or in the case of Stowe decreases over the past five years. And you would see the impact of the changing enrollment uh, particularly in Stowe, impacts the proportionality of those assessments of the, per, the, the percentage of burden for each of those towns. So before we get on to the next part uh, of explaining uh, this year's FY23 budget, uh, Mr. Boyle, I wanted to stop there and field any questions that our, the committees may have regarding the construction of the assessments or the, the revenue streams to the budget. Okay, that sounds great. I'm not seeing any raised hands at the moment. Um, maybe it, you might cover this in the next part, um, but I guess uh, a question that comes up when we're looking at those numbers is that although there has been an overall decline in all three member towns in terms of enrollment, obviously the budget keeps ticking up. And so you might, you might just say a little bit about yeah. that and how it compares to staffing levels as student enrollment declines. I see uh, Mr. Trussell from Lancaster has a question. Uh, yes, th thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the exploratory cost was in in this budget. I thought that was going to be through a bond issue. So is it the full cost or is it the interest cost expected on the bond that's included? Ms. Maroney, do you want to speak to that? I can answer that. Yes. Yes. Perhaps your computer's working. No. Pat, you probably want to turn the sound down on your computer while you're speaking into your phone. Yeah, Pat, turn your sound to zero on your computer. Um, I'll the, withdraw the request. Only the interest is in is in the budget for this year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, as we incur costs related to the feasibility study, you will see that um, that will climb. It's um, nominal this year. If um, you'll see it in the executive summary with the new budget. Thank you. Does I don't that see answer any your other... question, Mr. Trussell? No, no more at the present time. I don't, I don't see any other questions. So okay. you should feel free to go ahead. All right, so let me see. You're seeing my screen, correct? Yeah, we're seeing your um, your whole Safari browser screen. 
Yeah. And I'm clicking on the presentation. Ah. There we go. There we go. All right. Very good. All right. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Miss Maroney to uh, talk about the budget drivers in this year's FY23 budget. Thank you. Um, the budget drivers for fiscal year 23, again, are um, existing personnel. And um, this is a year that we have um, a contract negotiation in place. Um, we can talk about that in a minute, in a few minutes. Um, insurance and benefits have always um, had some increase. Um, it looks like um, it has gone up a little bit more this year only because in this current budget, we had what they call a holiday for one month from uh, our insurance broker, Maya, um, because of the pandemic. Um, special education, as you can see that we have um, a drop in um, costs and a lot of that is related to students coming back into the district rather than being in out of district placements. Um, regular um, day transportation. We have a placeholder in there right now. Um, we're still in the, in the process of finalizing the negotiations on that contract. And we do not expect it to change. Special education is the same. Um, utilities, I think that you have all experienced yourself, the increase in utility costs because of the pandemic um, and we're experiencing that as well. Um, as far as um, facilities department, we have some projects that were put on the back burner and that we are trying to catch up with um, repairs across the, uh, across the district. And actually then um, it could be, um, a little bit more aggressive in that area, but we're pretty conservative of, on about making sure that um, only things that um, really needed to be done were done in this fiscal year. High school debt service, as you can see, is on the, um, the decline. And that was because we're uh, getting to the end of um, the fiscal year, um, 2000, I believe it was that we uh, started the borrowing for the renovation project. And I think that's about it. Those are the highlights. Okay. Here is a pie chart that um, gives you a better idea of what portion of the budget is represented by salaries and insurance. And also, um, you can see in, in the yellow areas, that's all other um, system-wide operating expenditures and um, transportation is also a big piece for us. So it's no surprise to anybody in the room that the biggest part of the pie here is salaries. And with salaries being one of the major drivers that uh, uh, we soon are gonna be wrapped up with, uh, that number will be shifting. Revenue, uh, you can see that um, we got a significant increase in Chapter 70 aid this year. Um, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, otherwise, there aren't any significant changes. We still have um, E&D appropriation at 1.2 million. And um, we have taken a conservative approach on charter school and other revenue. Chapter 70, as you can see that how, how it's trended over the years. As, as I said before, fiscal year 23 uh, appears to be a good year for us. We got a significant increase. That significant increase in chapter 78 was a result of the Student Opportunity Act and the funding formulas that go along with uh, providing services to students that are in our high needs categories. And so we are eligible for uh, a significant increase in that category. Not all school systems got that. Many did across the Commonwealth this year, 
but many school systems also only got the $30 uh, per student increase as, as one of the minimum chapter uh, 70 increases. Again, this is a historical use of access and deficiency, or e &D, uh, across um, the, the years. Um, as you can see in um, fiscal year 21, I made note of the fact that that was a year that we had some um, additional funding going into e and and um, we use that to fund the full day kindergarten. Uh, this is also a, a, just a bar chart looking at um, what we certify in e and We are looking to certify this uh, as of um, July 1st, 2021, about 1.2 million. Uh, we're trending downward where in fact we um, could have as high as a, a little bit over 4 million allowable in our e and The minimum local contribution for this year, based on the state numbers that we have right now, um, as you can see, um, it has changed a little bit. Um, it's up a little bit from um, the previous slides that we looked at for fiscal year 22. As uh, Kirk had discussed, um, how do we get to our number for the variable assessment, which is the piece that you know, the member towns are assessed? We take our proposed budget. We take out from there. We back out our capital assessment, and that would be um, capital assessments for the. Uh, that would be capital expenditures for only the high school. We then back out the local revenue, and that's all of the state and locally generated revenue, and that would be the, your Chapter seventy money, um, and regional transportation, Medicaid. And it comes up with the total amount to be assessed to the districts. Out of that total amount assessed. Oh, sorry, Pat. Um, there's a fixed assessment, which we talked about, which is our minimum local contribution. And then there's the variable component that is based on the um, enrollment. And this is a quick snapshot of enrollment. So the way our enrollment is crafted is it's based upon students that are attending their Neshoba schools, even, uh, but reside in their towns. So if you have a student in Bolton that is attending uh, the center school in Stowe, those students are counted in the Bolton um, enrollment numbers for the town so that we still continue to um, assess based upon enrollment in the town as stated in the regional agreement. And here's a picture of the um, five-year rolling enrollment with the formulas, as you can see, um, in the percentages for operating assessment and for capital assessment, which is based on enrollment at the high school. So I just want to, this can get confusing and, and, and Pat did a great job of explaining to me on multiple occasions, frankly. Uh, it's the October 1 numbers that are used. It's, and the SIMS data, the, the, these enrollment numbers you will not see on a public facing page from the Department of Education. It's the SIMS data reports that give us those enrollment uh, numbers based upon where kids are getting specialized programming as well. But the October 21 number is added to the four previous years to fund the FY23 budget. So it's, it always funds the budget that's in the year following. And this is what we're looking at um, based on um, the numbers that um, we had at the time that we created this slide, um, we have a 4.38% for Bolton, 5.91 for Lancaster, and 3.11% for Stowe. And again, looking at this assessment, you have your percentage, your fixed assessment, 
plus your variable assessment, plus your debt assessment, which is based on high school enrollment, to come up with your total assessment. And then again, we, uh, in comparison to the prior year, you can see what your increase was from last year. And I, I wanna use this moment as an opportunity to share with our FinComs that at this moment, two major drivers have to be finalized. One is to acquire signatures on the contracts with DBUS for transportation, of which we've been in negotiations with them in terms of lowering that cost for next year. And the other is the negotiated agreement with the NREA. And so we've had that session yesterday. We had a very uh, beneficial session. It was a productive session. Um, and so we anticipate these percentages um, decreasing. Uh, I would anticipate to see them decrease upwards to uh, uh, half a percentage point. So that would bring Bolton under 4%, bring Lancaster to roughly uh, 5.4 and, and Stowe under 2%. So those numbers will change by the time we present at the budget hearing to our school committee. And I just want the FinCons to be, to have clarity on that. It's not that we're withholding information. We just can't provide it until that information is finalized. Then one other um, relevant piece of the budget process is the school choice. Um, our enrollment for uh, school choice students is um, declining. Um, the last of the students are in the high school right now and will graduate. Um, so uh, I believe in fiscal year 25 will be the last class graduating um, somebody in the school choice program. So again, the revenue, typically it's $5,000 per student that we receive from the state. And there's also uh, another supplement uh, for those that receive special ed services. And again, this is the actual numbers that we had at this time. So I'll get into some of the departments and I'm uh, sharing these slides with you only because we shared them at the workshop, but it gives you just a sense of our departments uh, and any changes that are there. The changes in the nursing department are nominal in terms of contracted uh, services and supplies. Um, so with facilities, the increases I think are gonna be obvious to everyone. It's basically fuel costs and some scheduled maintenance projects as well that have been deferred uh, due to uh, the facilities budget being uh, um, uh, reduced in, in previous years. So uh, we need to work on those projects. So that is the lion's share of those increases. Um, with pupil personnel services, at this point I'd like to invite Ms. DeAngelis uh, to come uh, speak to this slide. Ms. DeAngelis. Thank you, sorry, I was having a hard time with my internet connection, I apologize. No problem. Um, so we have an entitlement grant um, called the 240 grant that we apply for. I'm giving you FY22 numbers because I do not have the allocations for FY23. So this year um, we received $847,060 um, under the 240 grant. We use that grant to purchase um, in and out of district transportation. We pay for the costs, um, contracted services and supplies and travel. Um, this year, we were awarded the American Rescue Grant, which is called the 252 Grant, and we received a total of $178,523. This is one-time only funds. So these are one-time only funds, and we will not know what the funding amounts are uh, until approximately July. We get these numbers around late July. So. Uh, we anticipate based upon our enrollment that will be similar in scope there. Ms. DeAngelis, I just sort of picked up there. I don't know if you can hear me, but your computer was breaking up. I'm sorry, my, I don't, for some reason it's saying my internet is unstable. So those were for social work services, right. 
across three buildings. Thank you, Ms. DeAngelis. Um, oh, Ms. DeAngelis, the preschool as well, yes. Sure. So um, we also have a grant funding through the preschool. Um, there's a two, 298 early childhood grant, which provides professional development for our preschool teachers. The 262 is an early childhood special ed federal entitlement grant, and we use that for instructional assistant salaries. The 237 community partnership we have an early childhood coordinator who provides um, services to students out in our community and in the district, and that pays for a part of her salary. And then again, the American Rescue Grant Early Childhood one-time only funds um, was $15,883 to provide additional social emotional supports due to the pandemic. Thank you. And so these are all, all, all funds that are there for net school spending, but they're not included in that overall budget number, of course, because they're paid for funds outside of our revenue streams. So in technology, uh, a minor increase in contracted services and uh, some computer supplies uh, anticipated with some decreases in, in hardware and software. Um, that is due to some of the relief we got through various uh, COVID funds over the last couple of years um, as we were funding through the pandemic. Athletics, our school committee likes to know what the cost of the mascot change is. Um, and so those, these things are noted in FY22, what was able to be funded. Um, Rebranding costs above just regular uniform replacement are cited here. Uh, we adopted a strategy of replacing uniforms as they go through their regular rotation of uniform recycling. So the uniforms are on a four or five year uh, recycle um, uh, 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 program. So uh, each season uh, we will be replacing uniforms depending on which uh, um, sports are up for replacement and that's built into the annual budget cycle so it's not an additional cost uh, as a result of the mask change. Uh, Pat do you want to speak to food service? Um, right now um, food, ser food service expenditures um, are pretty um, stable and we do not anticipate any increases except that we are serving more lunches because um, all lunches are free to students right now. So I put up a, um, a revenue and expenditure pro projection um, based on you know, the possibility that we may lose that federal, federal funding of 100% of the cost of the meals and we'll be uh, there'll be a component that will be for sale um, again for next year. Oh, excuse me, I double clicked. Okay, and ext ah, we do extended, extended day, day as well. Yes. Extended day has opened again and this year we are beginning to um, increase the, the number of participants Again, um, the program continues to be self-sustaining and um, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we are looking at adding uh, some additional staff for one-to-one um, one -one for the younger kids um, that are first entering into the extended day program, the kindergartners, first graders, and um, we're hoping to see the enrollment increase next year. Thank you. And our teaching and learning budget, uh, we're, I'm gonna go over some adjustments we made this year uh, in our, in our uh, non-salary budgets for both our teaching and learning department and the school-based budgets. We took a zero-based approach where we looked at actual expenditures over the previous years to determine some per pupil costs. And then we also shifted curriculum materials that are utilized across all of the schools and shifted them into the teaching and learning budget so we can track them closely and simplify how we're uh, looking at our costs regarding uh, curriculum materials. So these are the items that are listed here. I'll bring to your attention investment in the Renaissance Learning Platform. This is going to be a key instrument 
as part of how we assess learning uh, across our school system in both reading and math because we, we really need to assess deeply what the impact of hybrid and remote learning has been for our students. And this curriculum platform, this assessment platform is gonna be a key element to that. Um, we are, however, gonna be able to pay for that uh, platform through the use of our ESSER funds. So some people at times have, have asked what the school district ARPA funds are. Uh, we don't have ARPA funds, ours is the ESSER funds, and this is uh, all related uh, uh, to impact as a result of hybrid and remote learning. So when we look at the teaching and learning budget, uh, the shift of those dollars along with uh, some shift in salary results in a $57,000 increase in the teaching and learning budget. Uh, that shift in salary is not a new position. It was shifting a position that was being held in a grant. And when you put the positions in one of the entitlement grants, you have to pay the 11% MTRS contribution out of your grant funds, they're reserved, held out. And so what ends up happening is we also have to hold that, we also have to do, pay the MTRS contribution out of our payroll system. So in essence, what ends up happening is we have to pay MTRS twice. So uh, we did a re some reorganization of our grants and put non-MTRS uh, impacted uh, um, elements into those grant grants, curriculum materials and such as well, uh, were allowable under the grant guidelines and, and kept the positions then in the budget. That way we're able to optimize and not lose the 11% MTRS element. So that explains why you see the increase there in the teaching and learning budget. So the ESSA grant, uh, these are the entitlement grants. So otherwise known as Title I, Title IIA, Title III, and Title IV. And these uh, grant amounts are provided to us uh, in the summertime, uh, looking and are based off of uh, our high needs population and, and state and federal formulas there. Uh, we've been very consistent in these numbers with beginning to see a rise in English language learner numbers. So these are relatively consistent over time. We will not be crossing into any funding thresholds that would take us into a higher funding formula. So we anticipate uh, coming in at about the, the same place and, and being able to continue to fund these programs. What's important is that these programs are uh, supplement, not, not supplant programs. So you can't pay for what you're already doing out of entitlement grants. It has to be supplemental to what you're uh, already doing. The ESSER three funding, which is the current uh, federal grant money from um, uh, uh, the federal government. And this year uh, we have dedicated a por portion of the $831,000 we were afforded to salary for our high school dean position support staff and our learning liaisons who are working with students that are in quarantine remotely as our learning liaison, and then some contracted services uh, that we can utilize there as well. The balance of that grant will need to be extended, uh, expended by the end of next year. And so anticipating what we may need for next year, uh, the high school dean of students position uh, is included in this grant. This was a, a, a decision of the previous superintendent that I had left intact, barring another solution to transfer that position over. I'll tell the committee now, as I shared with my school committee, this is a number one priority position. So I will be presenting it in the FY24 budget next year as a new position, even though it currently asks but I'm not gonna utilize grant funded positions and walk them over into the budget uh, without the school committee approval on that. Uh, we need to bring in some building based substitutes. If you follow the school system, you'll know that finding substitutes for our classrooms has been a near impossible task, not just for our school district, but for school districts all across the region. And so by having building based substitute positions uh, afforded in our budget, we can guarantee somebody work for 180 days in the school year. And it's based on the salary rate of our, our bachelor's uh, one step in our uh, salary schedule. These are one year only 
positions. Um, and if for any reason we saw that they were uh, had utility and advanced uh, what we're trying to do for teaching and learning, they would again be offered up as um, new positions in the future. Lunch and recess monitors we want to bring in because uh, due to coverages during lunch and recess as a result of COVID, we have uh, been pressed to the limit in terms of all of our staff and pressed on ensuring that we can provide all the necessary services that we're required to provide to children. So by bringing lunch and recess monitors in to uh, the elementary schools, this is for the, the three uh, elementary schools, um, we will be able to provide some relief there so that we're not up against uh, meeting uh, required instructional minutes for students. And then I mentioned the Renaissance Learning Platform with its partner product, Schoolzilla, as our student data management system, of which we will measure impacts of learning as a result of hybrid and remote instruction. And then leaving a professional development piece around social emotional learning, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Could, could we pause at that last slide for one second? Yes. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understood everything that you had gone through. So these SR3 funds are sort of one-time federal funds out of That's the right. American Rescue Plan. Um, That's right. So of the positions that are shown here, I think I heard you say that you're going to ask for the school committee to approve the, um, the high school dean beginning in FY24 as an ongoing position. Yes. Uh, I missed whether any of the other positions are also going to be ideally folded into the FY24 as an ongoing operating expense? Uh, they are not, Mr. Boyle, and I've instructed that with our principals as well. Um, okay. uh, Mr. Boyle, I, I will say that if we come to find that the building-based substitute strategy is an effective strategy for ensuring that we have substitutes in our school system, you know, I'll reserve the right to make that request in the future. Um, it's a strategy we just have to employ right now because we, we don't have any kind of substitute pool. Uh, our principals are reaching out and grabbing community members as much as they can to come in and be substitutes, uh, but it has been a real, real issue with the school system this year. So we anticipate use, utilizing these to help us get through next year. And my hope is, is that as, as uh, we return to a sense of normalcy, our substitute pool will return as well, but that's yet to be determined. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on SO3 funding then? Okay. Um, looking at non-salary school budgets, as I mentioned before, we, we worked uh, with the school principals on going to zero-based principals and looking at our actuals and our expenditures and defining what belongs in each of these categories. So we did a lot of adjustments. Some principals were playing for one type of material, say out of office supplies, and another uh, principal was buying that same thing, but it was categorized in classroom supplies. So what we've done as a group is come to an agreement on those items and then looked at our actuals and we were able to assign per pupil amounts in these categories for future lines in their non-salary budgets. And I share that with you because there's a real impact on the non-salary line of each school. For MRE, you can see they were pretty close uh, to, to what uh, those per pupil expenditures came out. But for Luther Burbank, you would see there's a significant drop of 44% there. A big portion of that is some of the curriculum materials that we shifted into the teaching learning budget under Dr. McGuire's care. Center School saw a reduction of 21% in their non-salary. Hale, 46, Florence Sawyer, 22, Neshoba High School, 11. So when you look at the total reductions in non-salary items in the schools, by taking this uh, zero-based approach, you looking at actuals from previous years and developing per pupils, we were able to find some savings in our budget. And so uh, we were able to shrink those non-salary items uh, almost 19% from the previous year. What does that equate to in actual dollars? Well, the shifts in teaching and learning showed an increase of 57,000. 
but the non-salary school the school non-salary decreases were 176,000, resulting in a non-salary reduction in those school-based budgets by $119,000. So I hope uh, our FinComs uh, see that using these approaches is, is uh, we're, we're being very thorough in our budget analysis, even at the building level and budget development. So the last piece is new positions. We are gonna add a, a, a 0.5 special education teacher at Center School in Stowe a 0.4 BCBA increase at Florence Sawyer School in Bolton, and a 0.5 school psychologist for the district because we have had uh, a significant increase in testing requests for students uh, uh, for, for, to identify if students have disabilities. What I want to express to this committee, and it connects back to your question earlier, Mr. Boyle, we are going to be able to add these positions to the school system at a zero increase to the budget. And the reason why we're going to be able to do that is where we've seen declining enrollment, we're going to be able to shift those FTEs to these positions that are desperately needed without adding an additional FTE uh, to the school budget. I think the simplest way to paint this is right now, it's looking very fairly certain that uh, kindergarten enrollment in Lancaster uh, is not going to meet the benchmark for needing four sections of kindergarten. So they would need three sections and we would reappropriate that position. Um, and then we have a couple of other spots that we can reappropriate as well. And so with that, Mr. Boyle, I think we can just open it up to questions from the committee. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much. It was a ton of great information. Um, I'm sure everybody feels like we got a lot to think about. Um, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. People might be formulating their questions, but I did have one that I, I didn't want to forget, which was um, about the chapter 70 uh, state aid number. So I, I think it went up by roughly 1.2 million this year. Yeah. Is that going to be kind of like the new baseline? Or is uh, Yeah, so that is our new baseline for future years. So it is based off of an enrollment number and there's a minimum annual increase of $30 per student in chapter 78. So if you extrapolate that over uh, 3,000 students in the school system, we could expect at a minimum next year of seeing a chapter eight in chapter 78 increase of $90,000. Um, but it could likely be more due to some of the form formula balancing that they're trying to do uh, all across the state in a multi-year process that we benefited from this year. Okay. But what that looks like next year, Mr. Boyle, your guess is as good as mine. All right, I see a question from Eric Benedict. Um, yes, just um, thank you so much for all this information. I really I'm appreciate done, you pulling it all together. Um, Question about the new high school dean of student position. Um, yeah. So the the funding for this job is coming out of ESSER funds, but that's correct. That's clearly not going to last forever. So that's at right. some point, this person's going to have to get rolled into the regular the regular budget. Um, what is what exactly is this person doing? Oh, this is the high school dean. This is a critical position. So the high school dean, while a unit A employee in our school system, he works very closely with the, with the uh, administration team, uh, handles discipline within the school, handles uh, social emotional data collection, daily operations, supervision. So the, the, the dean position is sort of you think of it as your jack of all trades or, uh, or you, your utility knife uh, in the school system. One of the things that, that I've been asked is, is, are we heavy on administration in our school system? Uh, I have to tell you at a high school of almost 900 students, having three administrators, two assistant principals and a principal um, is actually lean. Adding a dean into that position gives them the ability to do the work with uh, teachers and students that they need to be doing on a daily basis. So this is a critical position. It's a part of the ESSER grant because it's part of our social emotional strategy and support. So our dean of students 
just doesn't do uh, disciplinary things, reacting to events. It's a lot of getting out and doing work up front with students to help them navigate the skills. So it's not the same as counseling work, uh, but the Dean of Students works closely with the counseling team to help support students. Okay, and um, thank you. Um, one other question, and I know we talked about this in a previous meeting. Um, while it's great to see all these charts, you know that I wanna dig in on all the data. And so yeah. I'm hoping that um, maybe after this meeting or when you have more of your numbers finalized for March 1st, uh, that the finance committees can get Excel spreadsheets sent so that yeah. we can really get into it. Yeah, as, as, as we talked about that, uh, I'll work with the chairs and, and uh, get into that information. We uh, need to present that to our school committee and they need to vote a budget for us to give you a budget. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we need to go through that process. Great, thank you. Okay, I see a, a question from Mr. Trussell. Uh, yes, once again, related. Um, with that 80,000 and with the uh, other temporary positions, which will become permanent, you're well over 650,000. If I just divide that by three, simple three, I'm at 200 plus thousand. You're already planning an increase for next year? No, Is Mr. Trussell, we said we're not assuming those positions, just the high school dean position. What, what are the other positions that total the 600,000? They're one-time only positions as a result of hybrid and remote learning as we recover out of that period from the pandemic. And, and if you need them this year, why will you not need them in the future? Because, because we hope the recovery that, will be done? Uh, no, because we hope that our substitute pools will return at that time. Uh, we need to bring these in here because our substitute pools are so depleted. We don't have any substitutes. So we have to go out and, and hire people in a more permanent fashion for the year to ensure that we have those coverages in our schools. Okay, well, thank you very much. You bet, Mr. Trestle. So this is Michelle from the uh, Lancaster Finance Committee. And Hi, Michelle. And from what I understand is we're looking at a 5.91% increase, which is about $875,000 for us. Um, from what I've been told is we're looking at our, our revenues are only increasing $700,000. So I just want everyone to understand Lancaster is having a trouble here. I mean, last year we did a 5% decrease in our budget for all the operating expenses. I mean, I can't ask my departments to keep cutting down. I, I can't, I, I'm just, I'm having a hard time here. Um, so I don't know what kind of, if you guys have some grants that you think might come through, if you can look at using some more of your E&D money, but this is gonna put us in a really hard situation right now. And um, I don't know what to say other than this is where we are. I mean, we we're, we're going through the budget. I know the other two towns are as well. It, it's, we're in a tough situation. I mean, we don't have the revenues to keep supporting this. I mean, we can continue taking from free cash, but I'm, I'm kind of at a lack here as far as, you know, are you guys looking at, you know, are there any grants that you think that are gonna come through? Can you possibly utilize some more E&T? Can you look at doing what we had to do last year, which is ask our budgets to, you know, our departments to cut stuff down, you know, just to keep things balanced. Uh, I'm, I'm just really, you know, as the finance director, as the finance chairman, you know, this is what I'm looking at and uh, it's tough. Well, I, I certainly sympathize with you. And as I dug deep to understand how regional assessments are built and the responsibilities of that, Lancaster is, is feeling the pinch of what it means to be a, a town on the rise. Uh, it's, it's relative wealth index is growing. And, um, that the impact of how then the formulas are crafted through the regional agreement and also state formulas um, have an impact in that way. So when you then are in a regional agreement tied to enrollment with other towns, what ends up happening is where changes in other towns happen, 
impacts Lancaster as well. So over the course of a 30 year period, all of our towns, I'd, I would be willing to bet have experienced some degree of that sort of um, uh, push and pull effect. So I, I certainly, I, I sympathize with you on this a great deal. I will remind you that while you look at the 5.91 number and, and I'll, I'll remind you as well, we worked really hard to get to this meeting uh, as far as we possibly could. When we are able to th then release uh, the negotiated agreement details with our associations, as well as the bus contract re reduction that we're negotiating, it is going to provide some relief there. I'm hoping. I mean, I like yeah. to see that salaries went up seven seven percent. Is um, you know every year. You know, um, I I see that the school salaries go up more than the cost of living adjustments. So I have a hard time with that, and um, I understand that it's all negotiation stuff, which is beyond what we can handle or we can deal with or, or, you know, but, you know, this is, this is getting tough for us. I mean, I don't know if anybody else in my finance committee wants to join in on this, but I, I, I'm just stating that this is really every year. We, we really have a hard time with the, the school budgets because they go up more then what our general revenues go up. And there's only so many years that we can continue to continue um, pulling from free cash. I mean, we're doing the best we can as far as trying to get our revenues up. Obviously it's not your issues. Um, but you know, when I see like salaries are going up 7% and our revenues are only going up, uh, you know, three, 4%, it, it makes it tough. I mean, I don't know what anybody else is, you know, the other towns are dealing with, but this is where we are in Lancaster. Yeah, Michelle, I can, I can add um, just that from Bolton's perspective, and we've, we've gone through this with the, the superintendent in another meeting, but just to sort of show that um, even like a three, three and a half percent increase in our assessment, it essentially eats up all of our prop two and a half new growth and often much of our other new assessors growth. And so, um, although I think the, the situation in Lancaster may be even worse this year, we've been in a similar position and continue to be in a tough spot. Right. I mean, we'll, we will do what we have to. Um, if it's free cash, it's free cash, but that's not, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years now and um, borrowing from free cash year after year is not a good policy you know, from a town perspective. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying is we've tightened our belt as much as we could last year. We did a 5% decrease to all of our departments across the board for operating costs. And, um, you know, it, it's just tough. And I can't ask them to cut anything else because we're really down to, we're down to bare bones, guys. You know. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Michelle. And and I recognize that when we were looking at the positions that advanced forward, uh, I would like to tell the committee, um, as our as our schools have have provided for me thoughts on what they need for positions in their school to do some special programming, we're we're telling them no, um, and that anything we do it has to be essential, and we have to find it from within what our current FTE alignment is. So I just want to express to you that we've done that work this year to make sure that we weren't advancing forward any more, any new positions or any new benefit eligible positions uh, to the school system um, because we're going to try to cover all those things. And, you know, the ones I've talked about through existing positions or those grants. So my hope is uh, I, I'll bring forward the dean position as a new position next year but that doesn't necessarily it will mean it will be an added position because if we can find the economies within the school budget in our FDE staffing to transfer over to cover that position because of a, of a change in class sizes, for instance, um, um, we would do that first. And so as, I, as I've looked at our enrollment across the school system, I've looked at it at class by class 
and also um, at our high school. And so we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, we have a school committee policy that was established years ago relative to uh, um, a school choice, actually, when we were bringing students in that we wouldn't exceed class sizes in grades K-1 and 2 of 22 students per class, and then grades above that of 24 students per class. So I'm gonna to continue to hold our principals accountable to those metrics uh, so that we're being um, responsible in terms of the number of positions that we're asking to fill, because that is the biggest driver in the budget, as we all know, 66% of the budget. I appreciate it, Kirk. Thank just you, Michelle. Want, I, just, I just wanted to let you know the dire situation we're in, so. Uh, and Michelle, I also wanna use this as an opportunity that, uh, um, the three town administrators and myself have been meeting regularly, and my hope is that our, with our three uh, FinCon chairs, we'll continue those conversations moving forward so that we can continue to collaborate on solutions. I look forward to it. I really, and I appreciate this. This is very nice. This is probably one of the, uh, in my 10 years, probably the best presentation of the school budget that I've seen for the show. I, I thank you for that. Thank you. And I, I thank Pat as well. Uh, Pat has frankly been my coach. So <laughs> everything you heard in the first half of the presentation was actually Pat just being channeled through me. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to let you know our, uh, our tales of woe. Thank you. I see we've got a question from Bob Guerrero. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Bob Guerrero from the hi, Bolton uh, Advisory Committee. Um, first, thanks for the presentation. Uh, a lot of great information here. Um, could you elaborate a little more on uh, what's in the, the facilities department budget? And, and there's a 13% increase. It's about $200,000. What, what goes into that? Um, I can elaborate on that. Thank you, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to search for the slide. So please go ahead, Pat. We have um, a number of um, costs in, in, the, in, the budget, in the facilities budget that are required. Um, inspections and compliance are continually on the rise. Um, that's totally out of our control. We, there really isn't anything we can do about that. And, and that's one particular, um, area of, of, of that part of the budget that is um, volatile year to year, especially with all of the water testing and everything that's going on across the state. Another piece, um, of course, we talked about the utilities and um, maintaining the boilers. Um, we, we need to make sure that they're up to par. When we have a cold snap like this, um, we have to make sure we have the funds to bring people in, you know, to repair the, the boilers. Um, I don't think that we've underspent that part of the budget even once in, in all the years that I've um, been in this position. Um, so as there stated, is no fluff in the budget at yeah. all, I can tell you. Um, there is um, some scheduled maintenance that has to take place. Yeah. Um, there's some floors that are in need of repair. Uh, they uh, discolored and have had some moisture underneath. They've been tested and we've determined that then you're not any danger to the um, students. But um, when they get uh, moisture damage, as I said, they they need to be replaced and that's expensive. Um, it's under the a lot of these things are under the ten thousand dollar threshold to which it would be, become a capital item and be picked up by the towns. But we still need to make sure that we keep up with all of these things. Does that answer your question, Bob, or would you like? Um, more or less, I, um, you know, I, I understand there's, there's general uh, maintenance that has to occur in, in, this, in this budget. And, um, Maybe in the detailed budget, there's somewhere a breakout of, of um, these under $10,000 uh, repairs or upgrades or something that, that occur that all roll up into the, the $1.7 yeah. or so. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put together that list for you and share it with the FinCon chairs. Thank you. Um, question from Stan Wysocki. Yes, thanks, Brian. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kirk. We pr appreciate the, the opportunity that uh, to present the assignment. But uh, a couple of questions. One, uh, and uh, this goes back to, to something where, you know, before your time, but um, last year uh, was a particularly difficult year for uh, the three towns relative to what was going on in the district, the district management, uh, and the school committee. And one area in particular was um, the amount of litigation, apparently, that was going on between the district and, and parents relative to special education. Uh, and um, during that time, many parents in the town of Bolton reached out to me directly, and in fact, both in Stowe and in Lancaster, with issues uh, regarding their children in the district. Um, and while we certainly don't want to talk about anything in particular, but uh, last year there was a ruling where uh, it was the, the ruling was that the district needed to pay the legal expenses for a family uh, that was in, in litigation with the district, $294,000. Uh, and I would have to assume that the district probably spent uh, probably about the same amount of money. Uh, and in the 2020, 2022 F, uh, FY22 school district budget, your SPED litigation legal expenses were listed at $52,500. Uh, and certainly is woefully inadequate to deal with a $294,000 requirement to pay. And in just looking at some of the, if you just Google uh, the, the, the amount of, of interaction that's going on between the district and, and parents, I can't believe that $52,500 is, is adequate to, to deal with that uh, amount of, of, of legal expense. Uh, in fact, and I'll just mention it, I actually uh, lobbed uh, two complaints against the school committee uh, last year, of which one of them was, was uh, the, the AG's office uh, found in favor of me relative to the school committee, which your, your legal representative uh, of representation had to, had to deal with that. My question is twofold. One is where in the budget are you accounting for potentially having to pay out this $294,000 uh, we haven't seen the full detail of the budget. And what is the district doing to work with parents as opposed to going down the litigation path when it deals with special education? Uh, you know, it, 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 these are costs that we don't necessarily see, but it, essentially you're using taxpayer money to fight our taxpayers. And, and I'd like to understand you know, what we're gonna to do to perhaps make it a bit of a better situation moving forward. Um, I know you, you're, new, you're new to the district and uh, you know, certainly you wanna work with you. And uh, I'd like to hear from you uh, what, what your thoughts are on that particular point. And I have a, a follow up on a couple of other things as well after that. Okay. Well, I think the first thing I can say is I'm gonna take everything you said there as good feedback for me <laughs> as we think about, you know, how we are moving forward. When we're, I can't comment on any particular legal cases that may be out yeah, there. I'm not, I'm not expecting or I can't even allude to, to you know, those, the, the particular amounts in those cases, you know, the case or whatnot. But what I will tell you is that I understood right off the bat that expenditures on legal costs are something to watch very carefully. As an administrative team, uh, it was one of the first agenda items, and Pat can attest to this, that I pulled together the team in, January, in July when I first came in and said, we are going to drastically cut down on our conversations and legal costs uh, with our firms, and all um, referrals to the lawyers need to go through my office. And so the result of our practices 
have resulted in a dramatic decrease in the costs we have used to date with um, uh, in terms of payment to our, our legal team. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe uh, to date, uh, Ms. Maroney, I, I, I'm okay to, to, we talked about this before, but we were somewhere, somewhere around uh, to date uh, $20,000 in expenditures for this year on that. I will tell you, I just paid the January bill. It was four hundred sixty-four dollars. So, we have addressed right legal track. costs. <laughs> what was that? We're I, right on track. I, I, I was uh, I was about to turn a cartwheel uh, straight into uh, Pat's office when I got that most recent bill. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm 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 sharing that detail and that story with you to show you that I'm paying attention to that and I'm paying close attention to that. Um, when it comes when it comes down to educational programming for students and recommendations for educational programming, there's complexities to that. And, and the complexities are case by case by case. And mm -hmm. in terms of uh, all the federal requirements around least restrictive environment, providing a student a fair and appropriate public education is the responsibility of the school district. And I have to tell you, sometimes what families think is a free and appropriate education is not shared by the school district. There's a matter of disagreement and that's when legal cases arise. And so we, we have to watch those as well because uh, in, in working on some of those cases, that's where you set precedents. And if you end up setting a precedent that costs you in the long run um, and it's not based upon free and appropriate education and the least restrictive environment and all the elements of, yeah. of federal requirements, well, then we're paying ourselves in even a worse position. What we're always gonna do in those cases for students is advise on what we believe is best for the student, regardless of the cost of it. What is the best program for the student based upon the processes uh, uh, during the IEP process? And so with that being said, the other thing about legal costs is not all legal costs also are handled directly with um, um, uh, direct payments to our legal team. There are examples of where they are insured and they go to, it, it's then covered through the insurance company. So that liability doesn't always fall upon the district. So the nuances of those, uh, boy, I. I a, I couldn't get into it, uh, and I wouldn't have that for you today anyway. But there's a lot of variable factors right. in that. No, I understand. In terms of how that's managed. No, I understand. No, and, I, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that you're looking at that, and I think uh, I think you, you you'll certainly will take a, a based on this conversation, take a fresh eye at all of that. And I, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, two other points. One on on the buses. You were talking about uh, regional uh, transportation. Uh, 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 you know, some potential reduction. You know, anecdotally, uh, you know, uh, I always find myself going to the post office and the transfer station just when the high school buses are, are getting out and I get stuck in traffic. <laughs> but, but what I've noticed is, is that, and, and it, 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 it's only been a few times, but, but what, every time that I've noticed it is that the buses are leaving the high school and most of the buses are empty. And I've had situations where I've, I've been behind two Neshoba Regional School District buses on Main Street, and they're both traveling in the same direction, and they're both letting out students. Uh, so so I, my, my question is, are we, are we looking at potentially maximizing the use of the buses where Perhaps a student may have to spend a couple more minutes on a bus, but you're you're having uh, buses that have a bit more students per bus as opposed to loading up, uh, you know, bringing bringing to the school uh, all the buses, and most of the buses are are empty when when they leave. And you know, I do drive a big F one hundred and fifty, so I'm pretty high up, so I can see inside the windows. Uh, but you know, you know. Perhaps that might be something you might want to look at. And again, this is just anecdotally that I've I've seen that. So you know, uh, I don't expect you to, to address that now. But but also echoing Brian Boyle's comments, 
We've, we have also had our share of problems in the town of Bolton dealing with budgets and trying to manage. We, we manage our budgets very tightly. We have probably one of the best ratings in, in the state relative to our budgets, uh, but we have a very high tax rate, which is a, a computed number, but we're, we're exceeding 65 and 66% of our total budget going to the schools. And we cannot continue to sustain that. We we reached the the the, the point of, of no return a couple of years ago, and we we really need to work with you to try to figure out how to to you know provide the best type of education to our kids, but uh, in, in some manner where we're not getting we're not getting killed relative to to our budgets. Uh, you know, I, I think you've you've received information from us. You know, three and a half percent is what we can what we can comfortably live with. Four percent is probably about the top. I think we need to figure out, and and I you know I I want to work with you on some creative ways to figure out how we can move forward because we cannot continue to sustain the kind of budget increases relative to the school budget, given that that four and a half percent represents sixty five and sixty six percent of our budget. So I I really want to work with you on that. Uh, moving forward, and I, I echo on my colleagues from from the town of Lancaster, uh, who have a, a, a bit more critical situation. We really need to figure out some ways to 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 deal with this to to move in, in terms of the long term. And that's all I have to say tonight. Thanks, Stan. I, I totally agree with you. Um, for us, a seven percent, seven plus percent increase is not. It doesn't work in our budget. Um, it's not sustainable, uh, and I'm with you. Uh, three and a half to four percent increase is something that we could live with, and we could deal with. But um, I'm just going to reiterate exactly what you just said. Um, we can only do what we can, but you know, going up beyond four percent is it, it, it's jeopardizing our towns. I mean, we're really having some. We're struggling, so. I don't know how Stowe feels about it. I don't know if the Stowe chairman wants to ch uh, chime in on this and see what their opinion is, but I just think it sounds like Bolton and us are having some issues. I for sure feel for you and it's terrible to be in the position um, where you're having to make these choices. And so I do empathize. Um, I was actually just thinking um, that once we have, you know, the Excel spreadsheet with the more numbers and more data that it might behoove for Brian and Michelle and I to meet the three of us if possible and go through it together and try to brainstorm ways that we can make this more palatable for everybody. Um, Cause the, you know, as Kirk mentioned, the stone numbers keep going down, but the district only works if it works for everybody. Right. So if I can respond to that, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. I, I, I want to be a transparent and good partner to our committees. There's no doubt about that. But what I'm beholden to do is present a budget on behalf of the school committee to the people of our towns. And so it is defining what is the educational programming that we believe is the high quality programming that our students deserve in the regional school system. And so in sitting down and offering an opportunity to share those things, it's, it's not an effort to say, uh, um, uh, this is where this has to happen or that has to happen in the budget. I'm sharing that as showing you how we craft and build the budget. But ultimately, the decision on how those elements are put into that budget are approved for the vote of the school committee that eventually goes to the towns and receives the endorsement or does not receive the endorsement of our finance committees and advisory committees. And I think in the town of Bolton, um, uh, it also, there is um, uh, advisement from, from the select board, if I recall as well, um, in their charter, right? Yeah, is that, is that board, correct, Mr. Boyle? Yep, yeah, on, so, the, on the, the budget as a whole, that's right. Yeah, so I, I'm more than willing to work with our chairs on that, uh, but it's in the caveat of we are beholden to our school committee to craft the budget. Understood. Um, just, I mean, I think 
the three of us uh, for the finance and advisory boards, I mean, it's just, it's a matter of, can we buy, you know, balance our budgets? Uh, it's tough for us. Um, I'm sure Bolton, I know Bolton has got a very high tax rate and still does too as well. And I mean, just ultimately we're getting forced to either all of us have to do either proposition, you know, do overrides. Nobody wants to hear that word. And um, I, I think my, my other chair people probably are thinking the same thing, hopefully. Um, I, I just don't know. Um, so I'm pushing back. I'd like to see Neshoba try to trim a little bit. I mean, we as our town have trimmed as much as we can. I, there's not much more we can trim out without starting to cut out like departments and stuff, which obviously none of us want to do. And that's just, that's the worst situation. And that's where we're getting to. So I hate to say that. I see um, Rich Eckel from Stowe has his hand up. Hi, Rich Eckel from Stowe. Uh, I'm on the Budget and Warrant Committee. I'm the secretary. I'd invite any of the select, uh, any of the chairs for the Finance Committee to come to any Budget and Warrant Committee. We had Ryan Boyle there almost every time. We also had um, Mr. Trussell there, and we had a Lancaster rep that came there. So if you guys want to download the budget, go through it line by line, you can. But if you want to make change, you should come to the Budget and Warrant Committee, understand the budget to the level that some of your colleagues have, and we will work on it with those priorities with the superintendent. That is the right forum. If you guys want to go off on your own, go for it. I'm just saying, if you, you know, Bob, if, if you, 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 I hear you say this over and over again, you complain about the budget, come to the meetings, learn more about it, learn what your colleagues have to say, and you will find how the budget is crafted, okay? I mean, it's, it's frustrating that I hear some of these members come to other forums and they don't work within how the process is, and how the budget is crafted. So, and I guess the other thing I'd mention too, the operating budget is not even how it's actually spent, it's not even in the purview of the school committee, right? We help craft the budget, but the superintendent is the one that um, is the one that crafts that and then presents it to us, and we give input and priorities and so forth. I understand that it's putting a lot of pressure on your governments, but as the superintendent mentioned, this is a cycle, right? You guys, your towns are on an upswing, still happens to be on a downswing right now. So, you know, it's, I just, I want to just emphasize. I, I know that it's frustrating for you all. It's putting pressure on your budget. It's putting pressures on everybody's budget, but it's not a mystery, right? There's a lot of, we don't understand how this works. We just heard a really long presentation on this, very detailed. And I've heard a lot of other finance committee members say, wow, I've learned so much more. I think I even heard the chair of the Lancaster board say, I've learned more in 10 years than I ever have, right? So come to the to these budget and warrant meetings dig into the details with us get the information going to through the right channels so that we can make the change that you're looking for but just going to different meetings and and saying things about the schools about how they're doing this and they're doing that it's not really productive right please come to the budget warrant committee it's open to everybody and we'd love to see you there Any, any other comments before we uh, wrap up for tonight? Because I, I, first of all, just want to acknowledge how much time everybody has devoted to this this evening, which I really appreciate. Um, I'll just make one comment about the experience in Bolton over the past year, which is that I think um, the, the finance committee, the advisory committee and our school committee reps have done a lot of information sharing over the past year so that we can understand some of the structural constraints that each of the budgets um, are facing. So there, there's some, as the superintendent showed, there's some numbers that the state dictates for the school district. And then on Bolton's side, I think our school committee reps have a better understanding of how Prop two and a half is really constraining us. And so I think that if we continue that, um, we, might, we might be able to come up with some creative ways to, 
to look at how we manage things in the future, because I don't think the situation in Bolton is going to change drastically in terms of new growth that we experience and what we can absorb in terms of an assessment increase. But the information sharing has been really helpful. So I just wanted to say thank you to the Bolton School Committee reps for that. So I, as the Lancaster Chair of the Finance Committee, want to thank everybody, Kirk okay. and uh, Pat, thank you. You did a really wonderful job um, explaining your budget. As I said, I just wanted to explain where we are. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just asking that if anybody can scrape their budget down a little bit, because we have really, really tried in our town to um, scrape our budget down to the bare minimums. And uh, you know, we're gonna have some hard decisions to do coming up based on you know, what these school numbers are coming in. And uh, you know, if there's anything that we can do to reduce our you know, assessments or, or the, the reduce the budget, we would appreciate it. At this point, um, I'm not sure what you can do or not, but um, I really do appreciate the presentation. It was very, very um, informative. I think I'm, I, I'm thank everybody from my finance committee that joined. So hopefully they all understand. And uh, next week we'll, we'll be tackling our budget and good luck with the rest of you guys in Stowe and, Lanc and, Stowe and Bolton. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, if there are no other questions, again, thank you all. Thank you to the superintendent and Pat Maroney and Joan DeAngelis, um, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I wanna thank everybody for coming together. And I'm, I'm hoping that in doing this this year, we've set the foundation for what we wanna do moving forward. And I will continue to confer with the chairs to figure out how uh, we can improve the presentation year over year. I'm happy to hear that at least in terms of the content that came out of the presentation tonight that you seem to be satisfied, but that does mean we won't try to make it even better next year as we uh, develop in these conversations. So I just wanna thank all of our finance committee and advisory committee members for being here, as well as any members of the public uh, that joined us tonight. So thank you. And a reminder that our public uh, will be able to comment on the budget at the budget hearing scheduled on March 1st at 6.30 p.m. All right, everyone, have a great evening. We can adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.